for the First Amendment to stand up for the truth and Amber's right to speak it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodmore. Uh, Ms. Bretterhoff? Okay. Good morning, Skill. It's good to see you all again, and thank you again very much. Ben told you we will be relying on the evidence, rather than the hyperbole and the personal attacks, and he was right. The evidence in this case, simply put, is overwhelming and compelling. In the six weeks, we're going to try to show you as much as we possibly can. There are many, many, many photographs. Now, you heard Ms. Vasquez try to say, uh-oh, you, you can't trust those as not the originals. She's got that wrong. It's not from the original devices. Ms. Hurd took all kinds of photographs, and her friends took photographs, and all of those remained on the cloud, and all of them have been imaged, and all of them have been examined by their IT experts, and they cannot discredit one photograph. Then she says, oh, and it's, it's got a photo editing thing. Well, all iPhones have the photo editing. It's where you can make it a little lighter or darker. You can move it to the center or not. That doesn't discredit the photographs. And we will have an IT expert who will testify that all of these are legitimate, authentic photographs. Not only that, but Ms. Hurd produced all of her different devices over the years, including her most recent laptop. And they were pulled from many, many sources. And all of them are identical. So if she was going to go in and try to manipulate, she would have had to do it everywhere. And Ms. Hurd will tell you she doesn't have that level of ta talent. There may be a couple of you on the, on the jury who have that talent. She does not have that talent. They're all very legitimate photographs. And listen carefully to the evidence from the experts, and you will find every single piece is authenticated and is true. And they show bruises. And they show cut lips. They show hair pulled out of her hair. They pull, they show all kinds, of, they show two black eyes when he head butted her. Those are all going to be there. We also are going to show you a video, and I'll talk about the, the time frame of it. Ms. Hurd took that on her iPad, um, and it was one day when she was in the, build, the, the kitchen with Mr. Depp, and it was February 10th, 2016, and he's on a tear, and he's going around, he's yelling at her and being abusive to her, and he's slamming the kitchen cupboards and their glass. And you can hear them rattling, and you can hear them breaking. Then he goes over with a big glass of wine, and he has a huge bottle of wine, and he pours more in there. And then she says, did you drink all of that? And then he sees that he's, she's videotaping him, and bam. That's going to be a pretty graphic <laughs> one for you to see. Then you're going to hear audio tapes which are pretty significant, too. Ben told you about the May 2014 plane, Boston plane incident, we call it, where he kicked her, where he was so drunk and he blacked out. Well, Amber audio taped him when he went to the back of the plane and passed out and was moaning loudly. You will hear that. You will also hear some other audio tapes that are very significant. One of them in Australia, at the end of the three-day hostage situation. You will hear, apparently, Mr. Depp turned on Ms. Hurd's iPhone. She was never allowed to have a password, by the way. He would never let her do that during their relationship. But he must have inadvertently turned it on. There's five hours of audio tape. It's during the cleanup of all the broken glass and the, the liquor and the urine and the blood stains and everything else in that house. And you can hear his handlers talking about it. You can hear them talking about trying to find his finger and that you can hear them say, she's stone cold sober. You will hear all of that. It's very, very significant evidence. What this is going to tell you is the story of a very different Johnny Depp. It's one who is always, uh, always, well, I can't say always, because he has the charismatic side that Amber fell in love with. But he has an enormous amount of rage. You will see the medical records and hear from the psychiatrists that talked to him 
for a while in 2014, where he admits that he has rage, that he's like a demon, that he views his, his wife, Amber, like his mother and his sister that he hates. Um, that's, the, that's what you will see. You will see that. And it'll be fueled by the alcohol and the drugs. Ben told you a little bit about that. You're going to see a list of his prescription drugs that his concierge doctor and team, who charge him $100,000 a month and have since 2014, and they are still his concierge doctors, that's the list of medications he takes in one day that they prescribe. That doesn't include the cocaine. It doesn't include the ecstasy, the MDMA, the mushrooms, and all of the others. Now, it's during these rages that Mr. Depp engaged in verbal, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of Amber. Let me introduce you to Amber, the lesser known person here. And I know when we were doing the voir dire, none of you had even watched as much as three of her movies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Amber. She's 35 years old. She's from Austin, Texas. She grew up outside of Austin, Texas. She has a daughter, Una, who turned one last week. Amber grew up in, in a, an area. Her father was a construction worker, primarily a painter, but he would br break horses as part time. They lived out on a, a ranch area. His, her mother, Paige, who died at, at two years ago at age 63, dropped out of medical school to marry Amber's father. She worked for the state of Texas in internet communications. Um, they grew up very poor. Amber has a sister, Whitney, who's 16 months younger than her. Um, and you will see and hear from Whitney later, because unfortunately, she also witnessed some of the abuse. Amber rode horses with her father. She tried to work with him to help him break the horses. She remembers having a broken arm at least four times, being in casts during that time. But there were some things she learned from breaking those horses that was very significant. Her father taught her she couldn't show fear, she couldn't show pain, and she couldn't show emotion. That's how she could break those horses. It's significant for you to know that so you can understand how Amber could have remained in this relationship with Mr. Depp for as long as she could and the dynamics of some of the abuse you're going to hear about because that's what would be her instinct is to stand up and not let him show that he's caused the pain, that he's caused the fear, that he's caused the humiliation. You'll hear about a long line of jobs that Amber started from back you know, age 12 as soon as she could, working in a soup kitchen, well that was volunteer, but then she took all kinds of miscellaneous jobs, lifeguards, everything else, trying to improve herself. She's not somebody who had a great break. What happened was she got recognized by a Hollywood agent who expressed some interest in her. She took her $180 that she'd saved up and she went to LA. That's all she had to her name. The testimony will be she worked all kinds of different jobs when she was in LA, anything that she could get. And she would go on, but she didn't have a vehicle. So she would go on buses and she'd go up to six, six different auditions in one day. She'd have a map and she'd have in the bust, and then she would just go around. She had a big sweater, so she could change underneath it to whatever the role was, so that she could get things. And she wasn't going for you know, famous actor roles. She was taking one-liners. She was taking extras. She was doing anything she could to make money to survive. And then you know what she did with it? She gave a bunch of it back to her parents. She started helping support them. Then when Whitney graduated from high school, she brought her out to LA. And, and put a house, roof over her house and put her through community college. She took care of her family with what she made. When she met Johnny Depp in 2009, when he hired her for Rum Diaries to, to star across from him, she felt like she was pretty successful. She'd starred in some roles. She had, a, she had an apartment. She had a vehicle, a Mustang. She could go to Starbucks. She could afford Starbucks. She viewed herself as doing pretty well at that point. Now, during the Rum Diaries, she, she got to know Mr. Depp. Not true that she was pursuing him or anything else. She was in a long-term relationship with Tasha Van Ray, and he was in a long-term relationship with Vanessa Paradis. Neither of them had any kind of romantic relationship at that time. When she departed from, 2000, from, from the Rum Diaries in 2009, Johnny started pursuing her. In fact, he sent her a number of gifts. One of them was a guitar, and she returned it. 
Now, two years later, fast forward, that's when the press uh, junket started. And that's when she had to come back and meet with him, and they ran on the press tours. At that point, she had ended the relationship with Tasha Van Rie, and he said he had ended his relationship with Vanessa Paradis. So during the press trips, that's when they started dating and, by both accounts, fell madly in love. She loved the side of Johnny that we see in the movies, the charismatic one, the charming one, the generous one. That's the man she fell in love with. But sadly, the monster came in the way. Um, and that monster would come out when he was drinking and, and when he would take the drugs. Amber will never forget the first event of abuse. She was sitting in his house in Sweetser on the sofa, and he was across from her. And they were talking about a tattoo that he had that had had, had Winona, Winona Ryder, forever. He had altered that to wine forever after he broke up with Winona Ryder. Just an aside, he had Slim, which was his nickname for Amber. When they broke up, he turned it to scum. But in any event, he had that on there. And Amber thought he was making a joke when he was talking about it. And she laughed. And he up and slapped her. Now you see the rings that Mr. Depp has on hearts when he slaps. And she was stunned. She, she had no idea what to think. And she kind of laughed thinking, well, maybe that was a joke. I, 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 what just happened? And he slapped her again. And then she just froze and just looked. And then he hit her again, and this time it knocked her right off the sofa onto the ground. And she remembers her face was in this dirty, filthy carpet. That's what she remembers and fixated on, the dirty carpet. And she's thinking, oh my God, I have to leave. I have to leave. But I love him. I have to leave. But I love him. And she sat there for the longest time. She laid there for the longest time. Then Johnny came off the sofa, got on his knees, started crying, told her he was very, very sorry that he had done this. It would never happen again. And he said some very significant words. I thought I had put the monster away for good. That's what he said to her that day. Well, Amber ended up leaving that day, and she went out to her car, her Mustang, and she remembers that it was cold, and she sat in the car for the longest time, and she remembers watching her breath because it was cold, and she was thinking, I have to leave him, but I love him. She just kept thinking that. She finally drove away. But Amber made the mistake that millions before her and millions after her have who are victims of domestic abuse. She chose to stay and try to fix the problem and thinking that she could do that. So she stayed. Now, Amber was also, she grew up in an abusive family. Her father abused her mother, and sometimes she and Whitney. So she had that cycle in there, just as you've heard that Johnny had that cycle in his house. And so what's the normal to them is a little bit more difficult for, than some of us can understand. You will hear witness, expert witness testimony about the cycles of violence and what happens with these people. Uh, and, and how they react, and, and all the dynamics of thinking they can fix them. She thought all the way through she could fix them. If she can just get them sober and clean, then everything was going to be that wonderful side that she fell madly in love with. And she kept trying, and she kept trying. She went to Al-Anon meetings. She went to therapists. She tried to do couples therapy. You'll, you'll hear about their tape recording sessions to try to resolve fights or de-escalate them so he wouldn't get mad at her for anything. Um, but you'll hear that he gets mad at her for all kinds of things. But he, got, he didn't want her to work. Here she's a budding actor who wants to be out there and succeed, and he doesn't want her to take roles. He starts controlling what she wears. He starts looking at her lines when she tries out for places. He nixes any, any uh, romance scenes, sex scenes. Uh, he gets mad and accuses her of sleeping with every single one of her co-stars. Um, it, it became a, a cycle of that, a control as well, emotional abuse as you go. But what's also significant in that is the property damage. And that's a hard one for Mr. Depp to be able to escape when he's claim, claiming that he's such a docile thing and that it's all misheard. You're going to see pictures. He writes on mirrors, horrible things to her, writes on lampshades, 
uh, you know, uh, on clothing, on countertops. In Australia, when you heard Ben talk about Australia, he, he wrote uh, the, the third day as Amber comes out after she's barricaded herself and gone through a lot, and I'll back up on that in a minute. She comes out, he's got mashed potatoes spread across the top. He's got, he's written along the wall of the staircase going down uh, all kinds of nasty things about her and Billy Bob Thornton, the last one she was in a co-star with and, you know, fucking ambition and all kinds of things like that. And then he's written on the lampshades downstairs and then he's got more on the mirrors. And, and then on top of it, you've got all the broken glass everywhere and you've got the liquor everywhere and it's, it's just, and then he's urinated, tried to urinate messages to her. That's the Johnny Depp that's the other side. Now you're going to hear that Amber tried to protect him all the way through. She didn't want the public to know this. She didn't want his kids to know this. And so she didn't tell people about it. So let's go back. The first event that I told you about was 2011. And how do we know that it was in 2011? Because Amber was going to her therapist, Bonnie Jacobs. And Bonnie Jacobs has therapy notes of, of her sessions with Amber. And in those therapy notes, she chronicles the first time that Amber tells her that Joni hit her. And it goes through into 2012, 2013, 2014. And you will see, and you will hear from Bonnie Jacobs, her saying, you know, this is a cycle of violence. This is a cycle of abuse. You, you can't enable him. You need to... You need to stand up for yourself. Amber will testify about how Johnny would get so drunk and so drugged out that he would vomit all over himself and worse, lose control of his bowels. She would clean him up. And, and you'll see Bonnie Jacobs in these notes saying, don't do that. You're enabling him. Don't do it. Leave him there. But what would happen was his handlers would then take care of him if she left him. So that's the, the story you're going to hear on that. Let me just tell you about a few of the events, and I'm going to start in Australia. That's the three-day hostage. She gets there. Now, you will hear Mr. Depp <coughs> testify under oath that for 15 to 18 months before the March 2015 Australia event, when he's there filming, that, that he's been sober, clean and sober. Then you'll see all the text messages for the last 18 months in which he's scoring drugs, in which you'll hear testimony from people in which he's gotten drunk and, and, and you know, taken all kinds of different drugs. The whole time, he doesn't get clean and sober, uh, but he claims that he was clean and sober, that she came there, she, this is a month after they are, just got married, she flew in from filming the Danish girls. She's there and he claims that he was just sitting there calmly and, he just, and she was haranguing him. So he took a shot glass of vodka. And when, she did, when he did that, she got mad, took the bottle of vodka, was eight to 10 feet about where I am from you, and hurled it at him. And it happened to just take off the bottom part of his finger. And then he says she came and burned a hole in his, in his cheek. The testimony is going to be that he self-mutilated on a number of occasions and burned himself in the cheek and also cut himself. But Amber never did that. And you're going to hear from the experts testifying about this finger injury and how fantastic this version is. But the other part of it was he was with Marilyn Manson for the week before scoring on cocaine. You'll, have, you'll see text messages of him getting it from his handlers, the, the cocaine and the liquor. And you'll hear so much before that. But Amber gets there, and instead what he does is he takes eight to 10 tablets of ecstasy almost immediately. And the next three days are just a, a, a cycle of, of, of very, very, very violent uh, uh, activity by him. Amber keeps trying to calm him down. She tries to get him to eat. She tries to get him to sleep. She tries to do these things. And he would just, at different, he was, you know, at times delusional, paranoid. He would be you know, mad at somebody else, then he'd be mad at her. Uh, and by the way, we'll talk about the prenup, but he called her lawyer, who she had because she wanted to give him a prenup and then they got married too quickly, so she was gonna give him a postnup. He called the lawyer from Australia, called her a bitch and fired her. You'll hear the testimony from the lawyer on that. Um, that's the type of Johnny Depp that was there. And he didn't want the postnup, he didn't want the prenup, but now they're going to tell you that's, that, that it was her that was mad. You're going to hear she had a lawyer and she was cooperating completely on that. 
So as you go through those three days of Australia, some pretty horrendous things happen to her. He rips off her nightgown. He has her jammed up against a bar. He has hurled bottles and bottles at her. He has dragged her across the floor on the broken bottles and the liquor. He has punched her. He has kicked her. He tells her he's going to fucking kill her. He fucking hates her. He's pounding at her, pounding her. And then he penetrates her with a liquor bottle. That's the Johnny Depp that you're going to hear about in this case. Now, after that, Amber goes to the airport, and what does she do? She buys a book by a, by a psychiatrist who's talking about couples therapy. She's already trying to figure out a way to fix it again, fix this marriage that's only a month old, and her husband has just done these horrible things to her. Now, they go back to, uh, to uh, L.A. He's got to get his finger fixed, so he has to stop filming Pirates 5. They get there, and there's another fight in just two weeks from there. He's still using at this point. He's still drunk. But Amber finds uh, on a TV screen, uh, his monitor, she finds pictures of another woman, naked pictures of a woman, and text messages which show that he's clearly having an affair. She gets extremely mad. Amber's, Amber can be jealous too. She can get angry. You know, she's half his age, and you know she she's you know, defiant. And we're not going to say she's perfect. She was mad as can be when she saw that, and she confronted him. The two of them were screaming at each other. Now her sister Whitney happened to be in the house. She was summoned. She literally was awakened to come and try to resolve this fight between the two of them. While she's there, Johnny starts hitting Amber, um, and Whitney ends up getting in between them. And Amber thinks that Johnny's going to throw her down, push her down the stairs because he's in that position. So Amber actually gets up and punches Johnny in the face. She'll tell you that's the only time she has ever laid one on him, you know, in a, a, an aggressive manner. But it's after he's already been hitting her, and it's in defense of her sister. And she'll admit she got him that time, and she actually did have an impact on him. She'll testify about how many times they were in their fights, and, and she said. You know, she's almost half his size. So he, you know, she said, if I pushed him, he doesn't move. He pushes me, I go flying across the, the room. There, there isn't any, you know, ability on her part to be the abuser. Um, what she'll also tell you is it took her a while to ever fight back. That f many times before that, she would do what she did when she was breaking the horses. She wouldn't show fear. She wouldn't show pain. She would look at him. She would just be defiant. And all it would do was piss him off more. She'll tell you that she tried everything. She tried everything, you know, from trying to be nice, trying to get away from him. Uh, you know, she would throw things in his way to get him from running after her. Uh, she, would, she would try to, you know, flail back. She would use her hands and legs, and she would go and try to fight him. She'd run into a room and try to barricade and push his hands and everything out of there. She'd try all those things, but she couldn't figure out what could get him to calm down. I'm going to fast forward now to the next one, and that is... Um, I'm going to jump you up to after the stair incident, and Johnny had to get surgery on his finger. That's the longest period of time he stayed sober. It was almost three months. You're going to hear that he has never been through rehab, even though he has been a lifelong drug addict and alcoholic. Never has he gone through a rehab plan. Instead, there's twice that he went to some New York hospital and did a cleansing. One time it was for three days, and one, day, one time it was for five days, and that's it. He's never made any effort whatsoever to get sober or, or stop the drugs. But this particular time, he did for almost three months. And you'll see the text messages. We're going to take you through this whole story and all the text messages and all the emails and all the testimony that you're going to get. So fast forward to December 2015. That was one of the worst. Australia was pretty bad, but this one was even worse. In this particular occasion, he gets angry for some reason, and he starts dragging her by her hair through the apartment, uh, kicking her, punching her, uh, tearing her hair out. At one point, she gets up and looks at him, and he headbutts her, and she gets two black eyes from it. Then he goes and grabs, drags her up the stairs, puts her on the bed, puts his foot and knee in the back of her, and he continues to punch her, telling her he's fucking hating her, and he's fucking going to kill her. And he's got his boot stuck in the, the bed frame as he's doing it. And the force of what he's doing to her causes the bed frame to splinter. That's how much force. She is suffocating in the pillow, and she's, she believes truly she's going to die on this one. 
she wakes up to her friend being there. She doesn't know how long that she was unconscious or subconscious. She doesn't know. But Johnny was gone at that point, and her friend saying, are you okay? Are you okay? You'll see the pictures of all of this. You'll see the pictures of the hair. Imagine how much that must hurt. But the hair that's out on the ground. And you'll see the pictures of Amber. Now, here's the ironic thing. The next day, she's got, she's got to be on the James Corden show. And you can see the text messages. She's not sure if she can go. She's worried. She's got two black eyes. She's got a split lip. She's got bruising. She's got her hair missing. But her friends rally with her. She's got a makeup artist. You're going to hear from Melanie Iglesias, who does the best job of makeup you could imagine to get her through the James Corden show. Uh, and she does it. But you'll see the pictures, the before, and you'll see them then. And that, that's the resilient Amber who says, I'm going to go do this anyway. Now, her friends, she tells, I, you're going to hear about Io Tillett Wright. Um, he was in New York. She texted him and said, Johnny beat me up really good this time. Can you help? And he says, I, I was filming something. I stopped. I, I got the first flight out of there. I'm flying from New York back to L.A. I see her on the James Corden show. I can see the swelling because I know her well. I can see the swelling. Um, and then he said, somebody touched her, and she flinched on the show. Um, he said, that's not like Amber. Uh, he got there. They hadn't cleaned up all the mess. He sees the hair. He sees the splintered. He sees all of the other things. And he is so upset. He was a good friend of Johnny's as well. He'll testify about all of his friendship with Johnny. But he put his foot down on that one and said, you need to have consequences. You cannot do this to Amber anymore. I am not your friend anymore. Now, there were several people that were supposed to go to Johnny's Island, Bahamas Island, on, in December for Christmas. He was going to bring his two kids. He'd invited Amber's parents, um, who loved Johnny. And unfortunately, her father used to drink and do drugs with Johnny a lot. Uh, and he was also going to take Rocky, her friend who lived next door in a penthouse, and her fiance, and Rocky's parents. Imagine being able to go to a Bahamas island for Christmas. What a cool thing to do. But they all were so upset what he did to Amber on December 15. They said, no, we're not going. We're not going to we're not going to condone this. We're not going. But he talked Amber into going. He guilted her into going. I'm going to do it with my kids. Please come. I'll be better. I'm going to get better. Amber went. And then he ends up assaulting her even there and sexually assaults her even there. Now, you'll see a video from them of the Bahamas, uh, uh, the Bahamas, the, the place that they stayed in, in on his island. And the video just conveniently leaves out the wardrobe in the bathroom where he committed the assault. It just goes around and, and makes it look like it's a one room, and his kids were there, and there's no way they could have done that. But, but you'll hear the testimony, and you'll see the pictures. Then from then on, things really were bad for Amber, and she was really considering leaving him at this point. And she was talking to her friends and confiding. You'll see the, you know, the medical, medical records. Um, and in February 2016, I, I told you you'll see that video. Um, that same night before the video, he called Io, till it right, and left him a voicemail message that he said was just absolutely delusional. It was crazy. He was pretending like he was the property management. Uh, it, it was just an insane call. And then the next day we have the picture of the video. Then we get to April 30th, or April 21st, 2016. Amber's 30th birthday party. She was going to turn 30 the next day. Um, pretty big event. Her friends had a, a tape that, that they put together of everybody giving her tributes. Johnny doesn't participate. They have a, a dinner and a party for her that night. Johnny says, oh, I have a business meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, I'll, I'll be there after that. What kind of business meeting do you need to have at 7 p.m. when your wife turns 30? Uh, but he, that's, that's Johnny, right? Um, and he can't say that it was an important financial one because he'd fired his financial manager the month before when, as you heard from Ben, he was blaming him for all his financial problems, so he's the, he's the problem. So he shows up late, drunk, drugs, and after everybody, and he's even drinking while he's there, and he's telling the other friends, and you'll hear from one of them, that he's saying, hide, here, hide the bottle from Amber, hide the bottle from Amber. When they all leave, she expresses her disappointment. He gets mad and assaults her again, including sexually assaults her. Then he goes away, and he doesn't come back for a month. Now, this is an important event, May 21, 2016. This is the last one, and this is the final straw that leads out to the DVTRO, the Domestic Violence Temporary Restraining Order. 
So he says he's coming over to get some clothes. He's going to go out on tour. She says, okay. He comes over, um, and he's, his mother died the day before, um, and he's already in a state. He's been drinking. He's clearly high. And he comes in, and he's got on his mind this obsession that when she, on her birthday, go back to her birthday, the next day she and her friends went to Coachella, but his housekeeper had come in to clean after that, always did, um, and the housekeeper had found so, some you know, feces on the bed um, and had been upset about it and taken a picture and sent it to him. So all of a sudden, a month later, he's got it in his head that Amber has conspired with her friends to defecate on the bed. It's human, not dog, even though they got two dogs and one of them has major problems. You'll hear about Boo and Pistol. Um, and, and somehow Amber was doing this so he would get back there and find it, even though he had no intention of coming back, and even though the housekeeper was there. And he, he won't lose it. He, he won't get rid of it. He's just obsessed with it. Then he decides that it's Io Tillett Wright who did it, even though Io wasn't at the birthday party and wasn't even in town. So Amber gets Io on the phone. Io's in New York. And she says, this is what Johnny says. Can you please just calm him down? Tell him this isn't true. Tell him we didn't do it. We have another conspiracy here. And, and, and Io's thinking, what? And, and you'll hear from Io. He'll say, Amber's fecal phobia. I mean, she can't even, you know, she, she's so embarrassed about that stuff. She would never conspire, never do anything like that to him. So they're kind of laughing at the absurdity of it. And that was the biggest mistake, because that triggered his anger. And then he, he started after, started hitting Amber. He took her, grabbed the cell phone from her, wound it up, and bashed it into her face. And you will see the pictures. You will see the booze there. And you'll see the, the form of it there. Now, I was very, very upset. He's worried, because he knows about the December 15, 2015. And he says, he says, Amber, get out of there. Get out of there. You know, are you safe? You know, get, get out of there, you know, as, as Johnny's storming around. Um, and he calls Rocky, who lives next door. Uh, and then he calls 911. And it's not clear you know, whether Amber said call 911 or he said call 911, but they call, he calls 911. But he's in New York, and he's genuinely concerned for her safety. So he calls 911 there, and he calls a friend in LA and says, please call 911 and just tell them this so they get somebody there so we can get somebody fast. I don't know what's going on. So the police are called twice, essentially. And now, Here's what happens next. Johnny goes around and he trashes the apartment before he leaves. He loves to do that. You're going to hear about his pension for that. He does it a lot. Um, and you'll see a picture of him in the elevator afterwards, leaving with his bodyguards. And he's a little agitated there. Um, and the police are called. You will see pictures of Amber with metadata on them, both before, during, and after the police officers are there. But what happens is Amber calls her attorney, the one that she had consulted after the December 15 event. And the attorney says, if you press charges, they'll arrest him. And Amber says, I, I can't have that happen. I don't want his kids to know about this. I don't want the public to know. I can't have that happen. So when the police show up, she refuses to cooperate. She says, on the advice of my attorney, I'm not going to cooperate. But her friend, Rocky, whose fiance was there, Josh, at this point, um, he takes them around and shows one of the police officers all the property damage around the house as well. And the police officers say to him, look, she's got the red mark on there. You know, if you just give us the name, we'll, we'll go get them. And he says, no, I, I can't. She won't let me. So they leave. Now, here's what happens and creates all of the you know, noise here that you're going to have to deal with. So the police officers don't make an incident report. They don't take a report. They don't document the property damage. They don't document the facial damage. Instead, they go out and they write on their CAD, that's their little system in there, they write verbal dispute only, victim uncooperative. That's their language for we don't have to write a report. You'll see that the police officers have another one later that night, another, and they put verbal dispute only. That's their magic language. Now, that's notwithstanding that you will see these pictures, but Amber wasn't cooperating with them, and they were quite convinced she wasn't going to. So as many domestic violence you know, calls that they take, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to. This is one that they, they figure it's, it's, it's gone. Now, the other police officers come two hours later. They've cleaned up the place at this point. They don't know that these police officers are arriving. But when they do arrive there, they try to discourage them even from coming in. Josh answers the door, says, no, the other, lawyers are, the other police officers were already here. 
and he said, and uh, they say, no, but we just have to see her. And they have body cams, by the way, so you'll see the body cam footage of this. Um, so they go through and they do that. And, um, and one of the significant things is you'll see on the CAD that, that the two police officer sets are communicating with each other. And that set, first set says, I don't think she's going to change her mind. Um, and they, they know who the officers were the first time because they say officer signs. You'll hear, hear this and you'll see it in the body cam footage. Um, so they go through, Amber says, no, everything's fine. You can see on there and they leave. Now, the reason this is so significant is what they have done with this in creating, and that's part of the counterclaim. Uh, and what, what their, and their version of the reality is, is that, that Amber calls the, clock, the cops then they don't see any injury, so they mess up the place, splash, splash a little wine, and then call another set of cops. Does that sound like the situation here? No, no. And, and it's really important to look at the evidence and think about this. You'll hear from many, actually, I don't know how many of the police officers we'll put on, but we have you know, between four and six LAPD police officers and experts who will say those police officers, even when she declined to cooperate, should have taken a report. They should have documented it. That was police policy. So when faced with this big public, uh, you know, big public uh, DVRO and all of the publicity later, now they go back to the police officers and say, hey, wait a second. You didn't take a report. You said it was a verbal dispute only. They're stuck. It, it, you know, if, if all of that was true and they admitted it was true, then they violated policy by not doing the report because they were supposed to take a report. So the police officers chose the other and said, no, there was no evidence. But you're going to watch it. You're going to see it in real time. You're going to see it on metadata. So Amber goes to get the, DV, the, the domestic violence TRO. You're going to see the letter that her lawyer wrote to Johnny Depp's lawyer that week telling them that that's what she, would have to, she was going to do if, but, but giving them opportunity here to be able to resolve it, to get a mediator, you know, just make sure that she's safe, that she can stay in the residence until they figure things out, that she can drive her vehicle until they figure it out, you know, some attorney's fees, whatever. You're going to see the letter. And you're, so they knew, and it says right in there, uh, she's going to go in on Friday. They chose not to go. They keep saying ex parte, but they chose not to appear, and they knew she was going to appear. Well, Amber didn't call TMZ, but somebody called TMZ to take all those photos that day. Now, you also heard them say that all kinds of people saw Amber that week, and she didn't, uh, she didn't have any bruises on her face. Well, let me show you this. This is what Amber carried in her purse for the entire relationship with Johnny Depp. She's an actor. Do you honestly think she would have left her apartment ever without makeup? Do you think that she ever would have wanted other people to see her bruises and her cuts? This was what she used. She became very adept at it. And you're going to hear the testimony from Amber about how she had to mix the different colors for the different days of the bruises as they, were, as they developed in the different coloring and how she would use these to touch those up to be able to cover those. She also used concealer, foundation. You'll hear from a makeup uh, person that Amber didn't even leave her bedroom without having foundation on. And one of the people that was at the building testified, he said she had makeup on and it would have covered that bruise. So that's, that's the testimony on that. Now, let me talk about the divorce just for a moment. Um, so they go through, they have the two months of trying to resolve the divorce. <coughs> ben already told you that they signed a joint statement in which Mr. Depp admits that she did not make any of these allegations falsely and not for financial gain. But they brought up the donations, so I want to talk to you about the donations for a moment. Now, here's the story. Amber didn't have a prenup. She didn't have a postnup. She w was more than willing to do that. But as I told you, Mr. Depp fired her lawyers and said, only till death. Our, that's the only way we're going to part is through death. We're not, we don't need a postnup. We don't need a prenup. That's Johnny. It's true his advisors were all telling him, get one. And she said, I'll get one. And she hired a lawyer. But anyway, she didn't have a prenup. So what you're going to hear is that meant no matter what, the, whether it was abuse, adultery, irreconcilable differences, abandonment, doesn't matter. She's entitled to 50% of everything during that marriage. Well, he did Pirates 5, and he did two other movies during that time. And you'll see that he made $65 million during those two years. 
Half of that is 32.5. Amber didn't want that. You'll see a letter, you'll see an email from her lawyer that she forwarded on to her agent, who became Johnny's agent later, saying, um, I want you to sign this because you're entitled to a whole lot more than $7 million. Um, and I don't want you to come, basically, I don't want you to come back and sue me for malpractice. Um, that's what her lawyer tells her. And then her lawyer says, I offered them even less than they, I, I, I demanded less than they offered. In other words, the seven million was less than Mr. Depp's team was even offering to her. And she said, I just want to be left alone. I just want to get out of this marriage. I don't want, it. I'm not doing this for financial gain. So she didn't take the money. So she said, I'm going to donate all seven million of this to charity, half to the ACLU, half to Children's Hospital. And, and then what happened was, the first, and, and by the way, the, the seven million was paid out over time. It's installments. It was over. You know, and you'll see you'll see the documents, but it's over a couple of years, right? So, her his business manager Ed Wake, and you'll see the letters. He sends the first hundred thousand out of the seven million to each of them, and says this is a pledge towards the three point five million that Amber's donating, uh, and she'll be paying that in installments. So everybody knows she's paying it in installments. You're going to hear differently from them now, but you're going to see that was the admission at the beginning. You're going to hear from Children's Hospital and the ACLU that they assumed this was a pledge paid over a period of time because that's what they do because of tax deductions and things of that nature. So Amber does make, she makes a $250,000 payment to Children's Hospital. Then she also makes a $250,000 payment to Art of Elysium, which is another charity that she worked for. Um, and used to feed and used to do a lot of arts work with the Children's Hospital. She pays $350,000 to the ACLU. Now, in addition to that, she also was dating Elon Musk by this time. You'll find out that Mr. Depp is obsessed with Elon Musk, but she's dating him, so he gives $500,000 to both of those charities in her honor. Now, she doesn't claim that's part of the $7 million. But what happens is that she gets, she makes her payments up through 2018. Mr. Depp sues her March 1, 2019 in this litigation. She can't afford right now to be making those pledges. She's got to defend herself. But she has every intention of continuing to make those payments. She has been a lifelong person who has served charities. She, she used to volunteer at Children's Hospital three times a week when she could. She's very much that kind of person, and she intends to. And both, both ACLU and Children's Hospital will tell you they have no reason to believe she won't be good on her pledges. There's nothing that required her to do a certain amount at a certain time, and she will give it to them once she's able to afford it again. Now, let me talk about the counterclaim for a minute, and then I'm going to, I have to promise to let you go at some point, don't I? <laughs> um, so Mr. Depp, has decided, you heard from Ben, you're going to see some really, really terrible text messages from Johnny Depp on how he viewed Amber Heard. He calls her some horrific names. But in the summer of 2016, he vows, he vows he's going to haunt her. He vows she's going to suffer global humiliation. He says he's going to live in her and she will never forget him. And he meant it. So, in, in the summer of 2018, you heard Ms. Vasquez say he wants to clear his name, he can't be called a wife beater, etc. But an article, uh, an op-ed appeared on the, the Sun Times in London. They called him a wife beater. It was written by Dan Wooten, the CEO, or the, uh, yeah, the, the chief editor uh, of the Sun at the time. And he is writing because Johnny Depp is being cast in Fantastic Beast 3. And so, he, he's, the, the article is, why is J.K. Rowling genuinely...
So you will hear testimony. Let me back up a little bit. So you have heard from Mr. Depp's team that they are going to claim that Amber Heard abused Johnny Depp. You also are hearing from them that he says that she cut off his finger. When you look at the text messages and you look at the emails, you will see that in every one of those, Mr. Depp said to Dr. Kipper, to David Heard, Amber's father, and to others, I cut off my finger. You will see that. He never, throughout the entire time he was married to Amber, ever claimed that she hit him. He never, ever, throughout the time he was married to Amber Heard, claimed that she cut off the finger. Only two years later does he, for the very first time, start claiming she abused him and start claiming that she cut off the finger. I'm going to ask you to look hard at the evidence in this case because the evidence is going to show that it never, ever came up before. Now, let's talk about the counterclaim for a few minutes. There's a few statements here. Now, they've said, why are you suing Adam Waldman? You heard from, from Ben um, that Adam Waldman didn't come into to, uh, Johnny Depp's life until October 2016. He wasn't there for any of their marriage. He doesn't have any personal knowledge of their marriage. Everything he does is based on Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp used Adam Waldman as his agent, and you will see a bunch of texts where he's saying, yeah, man, he's going after these people. He's doing all this stuff for me. He's suing my business manager. He's suing the lawyer. He's going at, you know, he's doing all this. He's also going to the press and making all kinds of statements about Amber Heard. And those statements are as follows. And, and Heather, if you can pull up the first. The first one is Adam Waldman, Depp's lawyer, said afterwards, Amber Heard and her friends in the media use fake sexual violence allegations as both a sword and a shield, depending on their needs. They have selected some of her sexual violence hoax facts as the sword, inflicting them on the public and Mr. Depp. Now, there isn't any sexual violence hoax. There isn't any hoax at all. But he's out there affirmatively stating that she's got this conspiracy with her friends and she's making these things up. And it's very, very damaging and harmful to her. The testimony will be that these Depp fans take and run with these things. And you're going to hear from an expert who talks about computer-wise when you search the hoax and you see that it just spreads out into the internet and the social media and generates a lot of negative publicity for Amber. Statement two, please. This was made in April of 2020. Depp's lawyer, Adam Waldman, said the various discrepancies proved that nothing heard and her friends said about the events of May 21, 2016 could be considered credible. Quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick, he told DailyMail.com. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine, roughed the place up, and got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, and then placed a second call to 911. Now, I've already told you all about the events of, of May 21, but I'm also, you're also going to hear from the second set of officers. There's no way that Amber was trying with her friends to now get charges pressed against Johnny. They'd cleaned everything up. They didn't want him in there. The absolute opposite of what he says there. The third statement, if you may. Depp's attorney, Adam Waldman, said, when Amanda Day Cadenay, that's a friend of Amber's, Amber Heard's best friend and Me Too activist, recants her support for Ms. Heard and testifies against her, you know we have reached the beginning of the end of Ms. Heard's abuse hoax against Johnny Depp. Amanda Day Cadenay never testified against her, but that's not the part that we're claiming is the, the defamation. It's abuse hoax against Johnny Depp. In other words, in all, of these article, in all of these articles, he's saying that she created an abuse hoax. And you're going to make those determinations of whether that's true or not. But what we're going to show you is that that not only was tremendously damaging to Amber uh, emotionally, and you're going to hear from an expert on domestic violence and, and inter, um, intimate partner violence, IPV, about how those triggers happen when you have somebody who's gone through all of this and she's trying to heal, and she's trying to get past this, and then bam, you, you come in there and you inflict this and put this out in the public, and everybody runs with, there's over a million, you know, we're, we're gonna tell you about a million different searches 
uh, on the Twitter from, the, from these different hits, how that impacts her emotionally every time somebody calls her a liar for what she went through and how hard she t tried to protect Johnny Depp so that his children and the public never found out about that Johnny Depp and how much that has harmed her and, and, and how much emotionally that's impacted her and re-triggered and re-triggered. But we're also going to talk to you about the, uh, the reputational damages for that. Amber made it through the divorce. Then she got cast in Aquaman. A few of you have saw that. That was a blockbuster. It was the highest grossing movie in DC films history ever, up to this point. Over, it hit over a billion dollars in a very short period of time. It was a mega, mega hit. She was moving forward. Then she gets hit with these defamatory statements and all of the Depp followings and the, and the computer and Twitter and everything else. Nobody wants to touch her. Well, and you're going to hear from an expert who's going to say, look at Jason Momoa, look at Gal Gadot, look at other people who started coming up in those tracks from just, she was Justice League and then Aquaman. Look what they're getting. They're getting commercials. They're getting all kinds of different film opportunities. These are the things that she would have gotten. Nobody will touch her. She's a pariah. Um, and we're going to ask you, as Ben said, to hold Mr. Depp responsible. Enough is enough. But we're also going to ask you to hold him responsible and, and try to fully and fairly compensate Amber for what he has done to her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Huh? Um, based on the time, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to release you for lunch a little early so we can um, just start uh, with the first witness when we get back from lunch. I think it's just a natural break. So if you want to um, go ahead and go with the deputy, um, just remember, don't, don't talk to anybody about the case and don't do any outside research, okay? And we'll be back here. At, uh, let's, come, let's get back at, I'll give you a little extra time to 145, okay? Just to give you some extra time downstairs, okay? All right, thank you. If you would go with Deputy Lusa. Somebody have the motion eliminates for me. I don't think I've received those signed orders. Okay, first thing after lunch, I get them. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, that's perfect. Anything else? All right, we'll be back at one forty-five then. Thank you. Thank you.